Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to welcome today Ginny Gang back to Colombia, actually, where you taught in 2015, right? And, and also to lecture in this auditorium where you've lectured before as well. But this year, New York has experienced what the opening of the Richard Gilder Center for Science, Education and Innovation, the, light, the latest addition to the New York Historic uh, American Museum of Natural History meant. And I must say that I'm so impressed, I was telling you now, that architecturally you could compete with the ants, uh, which is actually, I, for those that have been there, there's this amazing uh, installation of the ants doing their architecture slowly and collaboratively. And I must say that it's probably the only architecture that could, could compete with that very successfully. And I think that at the time that there's so many, it's so important to understand what is the scientific role in producing facts, collective facts that can be uh, shared and that can not be denied uh, 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 without more scientific work. The work that the extension of the Natural History Museum is done in facilitating access to science to promote the way science could be understood collectively and, and open to different audiences is something that I must say that is incredibly important and I, I want to commend you, uh, uh, Ginny, for that. I also think that that's an architecture that is not only catering to humans. It's an architecture that is formed by the wind, by the light, by the circulations, by the flows of the city and the nature the city is part of, by all those not more than human presences that the museum is talking about, by the geologists there. And that's why I think this project is so successful, because it's both talking of the traditions of architecture, but also how the traditions of architecture are relating to nature, to forces, to the mineral, all that that is in the museum, in the museum stands for. Uh, this is, of course, not the, the only project that Ginny Gang is done in the city and beyond, but I want to also remember that uh, uh, Ginny was, uh, a bachelor, has a bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Campaign. Uh, it's, it's really uh, amazing to see your entire trajectory, also a master in, from the GSD, but also a period of time uh, in Zurich uh, working uh, in, in, on urban design, and, and, and of course, uh, your time at OMA, right after you graduated from, from GSD, a time that also you, you work together with amazing people that end up having, you, you end up producing a, a little network of people that had a conversation that we all have followed through your work. And I think that's very telling of how practice, academia, activism, I think, works together in networks of people that keep having conversations, collaborating, what's probably what the discipline of architecture is about. Um, in 1997, uh, it was the, the year that the, that the Studio Gun Architects opened in Chicago. The Studio Gun gained an international reputation with the Aqua Tower. I mean, there was a moment that everyone was talking about the Aqua Tower. They, everyone keeps talking about the Aqua Tower, but there's a moment and, and also attached to many ideas and many stories. Like, the tallest building that has ever been direct, uh, uh, designed by a team directed by a woman, right? And, and that was, of course, very important for, for all of us and very important. But not only that's the importance of this building. It's a beautiful building that is very intelligently using the balconies and the shape of the balconies to make it possible to have a different relationship with the city and with its wind and its uh, environment uh, and reinventing what interiors, domestic interiors could look like. But also, what is the presence that they could have in the city? And this tower that was actually changing the whole character of the city of Chicago and understanding it is a big part of the work that you've developed for Chicago. And I mean, with the list of projects that you've been working on is very long. Some of them are, I mean, my favorite uh, is the SOS Children's Villages, uh, La Besorio Community Center. This uh, very, very, uh, very important building that is translated into images and form the collective effort to support children uh, uh, in need and, and that needed the community to actually support them, but it's very much also translated into the architecture of the building and how the donation of different materials and even the, the possibility of uh, putting together different concretes and expressing that through the building that was actually the result of donations. For me, it's very beautiful. It's, it's also kind of how the aesthetics of architecture can also be telling a story of community efforts and, and solidarity and translated that into something that through architecture can be sensed and the meaning of the building as a reality that is composing a different society is also expressed through its materiality. And I think that the use of, the, of these materials in this way was 
uh, probably one of the most successful ways of translating engagement through forum and, 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 and image. But of course, there's many others. I mean, I, I could go forever. The Columbia College, um, actually, uh, the, the Expo in Chicago, the, uh, the, nat the Nature Boardwalk uh, in Chicago, in Link Lincoln's Park Zoo, the two both houses along the Chicago River, and I think your entire work on the Chicago River and the reverse, uh, the, what it implied for the city and the long-lasting effects of reverting the, the, the direction of its current and what everything that came through that and how a from a contemporary perspective, a reflection on what it implied can be done from architecture. I think it's a big part of your work, but also gives a broader scope and culture around all the projects that you've been developing your practice in Chicago and what this meant. I mean, we could go on and on. I don't want to, to read everything because it's, it's actually, <laughs> you've done everything, right? Uh, the, but, but, uh, but I also think that it's important to say that your practice has been incredibly celebrated. Uh, you, you, in 2004, both in 2004 and 2012, your firm received the Emporis Award uh, to the best uh, uh, newscapers of the year. In 2006, you, uh, you received the Arts and Letters Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. You received, actually, in 2011, a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, a big, big uh, event for everyone, for all of us. In 2013, re you received the Architectural Design Award. Uh, for and, and I loved what how it was uh, explained exceptionally, exemplary work in public, commercial, or residential architecture design, acknowledging the broad spectrum in which you operate, and which, of course, is crossed by your overall um, uh, 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 effort and practice. And, and that was given by the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. Uh, I want to uh, recall a kind of two moments that you express uh, what your, your work was about. And, and one is uh, the in a conversation with Ginia Belafante that was published in the New York Times in 2016, you said, and so really designing this first, this fire rescue too, started me thinking about are there ways that design could help improve the relationship between community members and police if we looked at the architecture? Not that it can solve everything, but I think you know, maybe it can be part of that dialogue in creating relationships between police and community members, which are not just the confrontational relationships. And for me, this is loaded with architectural wisdom. It's not probably an ambition of solving something that is no one can resolve or can solve or make disappear, but definitely architecture can work in the way different parts of societies relate to each other. And I think this capacity of architecture to mediate it's actually talking of a very different approach to architecture, an architecture that is explained in its relational role that represents very well what your contributions to architecture are. And the second is from Michael Bullock, that is very, someone very familiar to many of us that wrote in, about you in uh, Pinup Magazine. Community advocacy, sustainability, environmentalism, interdisciplinary collaboration. This may sound like vast words better suited to a 1970s political activist that a leading 21st century architectural firm, but they are all essential elements in Ginny Kang's practice. Please join me in welcoming Ginny Kang. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here again. And after the, the last time I was here, I was teaching a studio, um, and it was a really wonderful experience and I met a lot of students and that are now colleagues and it was it was really great as well as the conversations with other faculty members. Um, so I thought I would start today just talking a little bit about what these things are that tie these diverse projects together and then go into the kind of like four just four new projects that um, um, I haven't shown much of before. So. Um, and, and there's some research elements woven in. Um, so Studio Gang, as we, we, I started the practice in um, Chicago, and, uh, which was my hometown. Um, but one of the things that was so interesting was how frequent everyone always spoke about this plan, the Burnham Plan of 1909. It's actually the Burnham and Bennett Plan. Um, and it really struck me that it why are we talking about this plan 100 plus years later? Um, and so uh, 
I really came to learn that this plan is what drives so much of what goes on in Chicago still and how important it is to have a kind of a plan, um, a big picture plan, even though there are things that were definitely left out of it. Um, what I was more interested in at the time when I first got to uh, Chicago was more about the, the ecology and this fantastic uh, situation of the Great Lakes, which is actually 20% of all the fresh water on the planet is present in these lakes. Um, and, and they are really the reason why Chicago exists. Um, it, it transformed into, well, from uh, days before industrialization and before uh, um, Western uh, colonization, but then afterwards uh, as well, this water drove the industrial production. And so all of these natural resources that came from the, the north um, and the water to combine to make steel made Chicago this really this transportation hub. And when you think about how much um, land that, that transportation took up in the form of rail, you can see here, you know, it would be impossible for an individual to get to the water <laughs> across all these rails. So part of what Burnham Plan was doing was to it was like a reform and it was um, civic minded um, uh, citizens to help pay for the plan and it was a very extensive plan. Um, so parts of this, this is just part of it, is just constantly being step by step realized uh, like the great lakefront and the 26 miles of um, public space along the lakefront. Um, and so, but what, so my practice and our practice as how we started to, to form it was, was driven by some different things than this, but it comes back to this in a certain way. Um, really the unintended consequences of the industrialization, um, which ended up creating like not only Chicago as a kind of, you know, polluted place, I guess, but, but also this entire rust belt which is something like nine states and dozens of cities that have this legacy of, of industrial pollution, um, contamination with water, land, et cetera, um, and the loss of all the work that, that, was, that went into um, creating the steel industry. So it, this is now zooming into specifically into um, the Chicago area and the presence of Superfund sites, which are uh, federally designated sites that are so polluted that yeah, you don't even uh, want to go anywhere near those ones. Um, and plenty of brownfield sites. So brownfields are a little less polluted, but still polluted. And it always shocks me to see this picture where you have this landscape in the back, this hill that's not actually a hill, it's just a mound of landfill. Um, invasive species, water, poor water quality. But What's interesting to this and why it's kind of the muse of the practice, I would say, is that this overlay of, of the polluted and abandoned sites is actually what makes Chicago and other cities in, that are in the Rust Belt, this abandonment is actually what makes them kind of becoming like the last frontier for many species. It's and a very important, important space for life. Um, um, and because it's not a monocultural like green lawn that, that, that doesn't allow for any animals to exist or, um, or the hyper um, efficient agricultural lands that don't allow for anything else to exist. So, so these are actually becoming really important um, network sites. And you can see there the overlay with the um, migratory path of, of birds on the Mississippi Flyway. So originally this interest in all this area took the form of, of an idea about reuse in the practice. And an early competition that we won was based on um, um, thinking about how you could redesign the practice uh, of architecture to, to use things that are available and nearby. And so we, uh, this is about, you can see the column cluster in, in the lower right is about like having multiple different types of steel possible to make a column cluster, whatever is available at that moment. So it's like 
you know, you just design it like a chef would design a meal, what's available. Um, the other unintended consequence, of course, of this overlay is the, the intersection of, of birds and flyways and cities and glass, which is a very deadly problem, especially in Chicago. And even this year, there was a big event of in one day, a thousand birds um, cra crashing into window glass they cannot see as they're um, going along their flyway. I've worked oh, since this project, which I also worked with Kate Orff on this project, we, we've both gone on to work on guidelines for cities and, and on policy to reduce this threat. Um, but this first project was about kind of thinking about a screen that could also be an opportunity for uh, people to be um, outside glass, but within a, a protected space. And that was kind of what the building looked like. Of course, this building never got realized, but um, the ideas in it certainly did, um, of all of our projects, our um, aim for bird safety. This is the Writer's Theater, where we use this kind of screen. In this case, it's a, tenson, it's a wood in tension that uh, holds a walkway that, that goes around the glass, and all the glass is treated with um, a ceramic fritz, so it's uh, safe for, for birds. So then I think what really becomes more apparent is just like this desire to repair things. It's a, it's a desire to take action um, in our practice through all, everyone that, that, we, that I work with. Um, uh, we think about it this way. Um, and that is apparent in, in some of the early work on the river uh, that Jacques mentioned, um, this idea of the reverse effect, like what is Th th this whole work started as a response to some legislation that we were trying to get passed, which was to make the municipality dis disinfect raw sewage that they were putting into the water. Um, and so we, we, we did research with the um, Natural Resources Defense Council and the Joyce Foundation, and we made this book uh, that, that showed, tried to raise the awareness of the public about this waterway. So it has nothing to do with like a building at this point. The issue of poor water quality, flooded basements, these invasive species coming up, threatening to get into Lake Michigan, um, and then the potential of all this post-industrial land. So this was happening in about 2010. It was still dumping sewage into this river. And because the river is reversed, you know, it, it's really pushing the problem downstream and not into uh, the lake where is the drinking water. So what the result of this, long story short, is there were step by step how to unreverse this river. But step number one was all about like getting some of this in post-industrial land and giving people access to the river, even if it's dirty, even if it's smelly, <laughs> um, but just let them get, you know, understand this river because for so long the industry dominated the sides of it. Um, so this resulted in a political miracle happened and the mayor of the city kind of embraced this idea and decided to build these boat houses to give students access to the water um, and to, to racing. So there were like four of them overall that were um, planned. And um, we did two of these, um, one on the north side and one on the south side. And they were really meant, that, that this is where the architecture becomes really important. So how do you get people to go to this place that they didn't even know was there? Um, so there was this idea of, our idea was like bringing motion into it, trying to make the um, roof very interesting, taking this, this kind of stopgap um, idea of structure and creating something that's very lively. And that, because you need this kind of, it's like a gateway drug, you know, for architecture to get people to do something. They need architecture and really good architecture too. It's not just anything. So you can see this is very simple, very simple framing, but with this, um, uh, three-dimensional surfaces created by straight elements. Um, and it just makes me really excited to see this in use, um, in so, so full use today. 
Um, so like I said, we, we were just working with this idea of a stop gap um, a row motion. Here you can see how the, the roof is kind of warped there. But r what's really great is what goes on inside. It's, it's youth um, after school activities. It's wounded veterans. Um, there's different kinds of groups that I did not even know uh, about that they existed and they just um, really use rowing as, as a way to uh, create better spirit and teamwork. And now, and this is the one on the, on the south side. So, but, so this is all to say that in 10 years time from that, when those came out and there was work done um, in the downtown along the river as well, there are many more groups. It's basically, it made people into stewards of the river. It converted ordinary citizens uh, through all these actions into being supporters and, and their advocates and their voters. And so it trickles up, it gets bigger um, than, it, than we could ever do on our own. So I think that's why I get most excited about and why I think architecture can be a political force. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into like some projects that we've been working on for a while but are finally finished. Um, first, the Tom Lee Park in Memphis. I might have talked about it for a while because it went on for quite a while. Um, it's on another river, the Grand Mississippi River. Um, such an impressive river. This, it's so huge and it changes in elevation like uh, 50 feet um, at different times. So we, Studio Gang, were hired to design um, a, the full waterfront for the city. So the city, basically the river was the loading dock for the city and, and um, the main street um, was, everything turned their back on the river and in tor toward this main, main street. And so we had worked on um, a whole 16 mile stretch of the river and then kind of zeroed in on a couple places. One was the cobblestone landing, which was, had this very fraught history, and the other was Tom Lee Park. And for the Venice Biennale, we, we exhibited the history and the future of the cobblestone landing. We actually were able to ship some cobblestones over to, to Venice and have Italian craftsmen put them into the gallery um, and told these stories of the different people um, who experienced um, Memphis in different ways. So if you remember, Memphis was a city where a lot of the memorial, uh, these like fake um, historical memorials to the Civil War people uh, were put up and then they were taken down. Um, and um, Tammy Sawyer was the one who led that fight and um, these are some of the citizens that we found in different, in different um, professions to give their stories. And the idea was to kind of make a new kind of memorial space that would be more inclusive. Um, so that project um, kind of still kind of moving along slowly. And meanwhile, they asked us to start on Tom Lee Park. So Tom Lee Park was just a dike, you know, not just an infrastructural piece that was meant to uh, prevent flooding. Um, and it was dominated by this festival, a music festival and a barbecue festival. And they didn't want anyone else using it, <laughs> um, these, these users. Um, but w we were asked to, you know, like engage the communities and find out what people wanted. And, and that was really helpful. We did this youth design leadership group, which now we kind of do that on some of our other projects too, just to get people from high school, like what would make you come down to the park and introduce them to um, design um, professions, I guess, landscape architecture, architecture. This is another project we did with SCAPE. Um, and, and so we were really thinking that this, that this city needed to go from Front Street and connect down to the park. So, so the idea for the park really extended out into the city. Some of the things the students were saying were, you know, we just want a place for everyday stuff like food and basketball or um, relaxing. So we have this big stretch of park 
and so much expectation, but what people were asking for was like everyday things. So that was really interesting. So we started to think that maybe the everyday things transform when they come to the, the Grand Mississippi River and become extraordinary everyday things. Um, so that was kind of the working um, thesis of the project. Uh, we were looking for methods of building. Uh, these are really interesting photographs of what the river looked like in the, these old, they used cranes made of wood uh, to unload wood and, and just really interesting working waterfront. It always had been. But the hero of this park, which is named after Tom Lee, um, is he was a, a black river worker who um, basically saved like 32 people that were drowning on a, uh, a boat that was on the Mississippi River. And he himself, he couldn't swim, but he took his boat back and kept going out and getting more people and saved all these people. So he was a true hero. So now we have, you know, there's that intensity too for this site. And that's the site, which is like, okay, whatever you want, <laughs> you can make it. Um, and so we, we also got sued by, and the city got sued by the festival, the meat, uh, barbecue, whatever festival, and the, um, and the, the, uh, the, the music festival. And so and we're going into arbitration, to, we, ha we were always accommodating their, their fields for the music, but we had to uh, go through and make agreements about these fields to keep them open which took like two years on the schedule, but it worked. So it's like you just have to be so committed, I think, with these projects that are, they just go, through, everybody has an opinion. So um, that was a design. We would have these clusters of, of intensity and then big areas for fields. And so it finally opened on, um, on the um, holiday, uh, Labor Day, it opened up. I have a little, video um, that we can see. So, and P it, what's so great is it just mixes everybody. And so the flexibility is really important. With, with our, we call these quad pods that hold up the canopy. Um, there's different activities you can do. There's, it's these everyday things. And, and um, but it's been incredible, it's just been adopted immediately. And it's incredible to see how people mix. Uh, there were so much strife in this town, I tell you. So it's, it's really fun to see this open. And um, um, a lot of it's, they call the canopy, um, um, well, it, the whole park is kind of the sunset theme of the park, but, but there's all these activities there. And um, um, Theaster Gates piece, which memorializes Tom Lee, and then um, James Little, who did the, the pattern for the, the underneath the canopy, so these, and who's a Memphian also. Um, so these are like some of the things that make it really resonate with the, the population. And I think this, these swings, they really worked well. Like people are sitting on it that, that don't know each other and they start talking. So that's just really cool. So then these little pavilions for the food are made with I'm kind of interested always in these old technologies, how you can reuse them. So we did that with the Arcus Center of Social Justice using cordwood masonry. Here we did, we used this kind of um, wall made of, these are, would be, these are trees that were about to become telephone poles, but found a new life in this uh, structure. So I like these techniques that don't use any energy. You just use the material as it is. Um, so these are these little point pavilions that have um, the restrooms and cafes in them. And, and, that's, and then the, the, the rewilding, I guess, of the edges and is really um, exciting. Okay, so now, um, how do these tall buildings fit into this oeuvre? <laughs> um, I mean, that, that's something that a lot of people ask. So I wanted to spend a couple minutes on this. We're, we were hitting on the theme of repair. Um, and so, and tall buildings, you know, they're, in Chicago, they kind of are 
a way to make the popu make the city more dense, I would say, because it's a city that sprawls out a lot. Um, but this tower that we recently completed, um, called the St. Regis Tower, this one back here, um, um, was trying to do something else as well on an urban level. Um, so this is the frozen Chicago River right here. Um, and then uh, this is kind of made of these two uh, core towers. There's three altogether, but the, the cores are in the outer ones, which makes a space available to connect through the tower. Um, here's another one of these things that we inherited, this Wacker Drive. It's, it's uh, right along the river. It's multiple levels of highway that were already there. And so we tried to open up this tower at the base, at the river level, at the upper deck level, um, and then make different uh, platforms that, that can just connect it better. So, but that's the radical part about this tower, I would say, is just that you can walk under it and you know, you could, anyone can, it's just free. It's not completely um, open, there's structure columns, but no core and you can move through there and people do. So this is really a gateway to the river, which is now, like I was saying, transformed so much um, downtown. And so during uh, the pandemic, people just started using it fully and, and to, to capacity. So that's one way of a tower can kind of repair. Another one that we finished in, in New York is the, we called it the solar carve tower, but it's really um, something 40 West 10th Street. Um, and it, and it's, it's on the High Line. Um, and and we were, we're really here trying to do is say how, at the time, a lot of architects were like trying to get sites on the High Line and like lean over it, because you could, and have great views down it. But um, we were starting to see that this is a park but it's un it's not like the sh the setback skyscrapers are defined are you know were made to um, protect the light and air to the street but here we have a public space in the interior of the block so it's not protected at all so everybody can go right up to it so this project we took it all the way through um, uh, lots of zoning reviews to ask for height and to not step back at the street in this case because of it being right on the um, water's edge on that side and step away from the high line. And so we, after a long time, we were able to get that approval. Um, and so it just opens up the views um, and, and brings light down to the high line. So something like thousands more hours a, of a year of daylight to the plants on there. Um, so that's what it looks like. And the carved areas were the special parts that we just put attention to. This was a weird project for me because we did not know who was going to use the who would who was going to go into the building. So I, we hadn't really ever done that before. So it's a, I guess that's what all people that design offices do. But in this case, it's, we just it, so it ended up being um, it with very high ceilings. It ended up weirdly being a car dealer. <laughs> and, in the building, um, but there is a good restaurant in there, so there's some public aspect to it. Um, okay, so then I wanted to now just move into these projects where and the recent work on um, what what is this repair all about, and um, a book that it will be coming out in uh, February called "The Art of Architectural Grafting." It's all it's it's about like trying to find uh, new ways to talk about re recycling, reuse, adaptive reuse, that just the words are just so overused. And we need to, I think, to make these interesting. Um, I've been working with the students at Harvard to, um, to think about grafting as a kind of new uh, generator of ideas about adding on. And one of the really interesting things about horticultural grafting, of course, grafting I love it because it's a very old, very, very old activity, human activity, but collaborating with nature and what nature can do, especially plants, because plants are so prolific and they um, 
So grafting is about getting more out of the rootstock, better tasting fruit, nicer flowers. Um, it, it really it emphasizes this um, exciting aspect that our, I think architecture can bring. Um, so it's not just um, um, a quiet thing. There, there is a, there's rules to it. Plus, you can't just graft anything onto anything either with horticulture. So there's a lot of interesting parts about it, and um, um, I, I think it really works for trying to flush out more ideas around grafting. Grafting is it's really a lot of it is a response to a wound. So even today, they don't know everything about how it works. It's not uh, uh, sexual reproduction. It's, it's really more like cloning. And, but there was, there's really interesting things about it in terms of like how people thought about it and thought of it as being impure. And that, I think, carries over to when we think about architecture that's been added onto. Um, if you look at renovations, um, this is a graph that came out of, uh, it's just a combined data set that came out of the European Union looking at the different carbon contents and carbon savings of different um, reuse methods. And so you can see that they're not all equal. But one of the best, most carbon saving methods is to increase the intensity of use on what we already have. Less effective, let's say, is like design for disassembly. Because to save the carbon for design dis disassembly, it has to, you have to wait until the building is disassembled, and then it has to actually be reused. So it's kind of like, it's not exactly saving um, in the time frame that we have, which isn't very long, it, to get this down. So it's from 2050. So um, a lot of the projects that we've been working on are exactly that, trying to increase the intensity and capacity of the buildings. Um, the powerhouse at Beloit College is a great example, a building that was, um, a coal burning power plant and and I love it because it's like uh, now it's going to be it is a health center <laughs> and a recreation center um, and a student union but this shows really nicely the original power plant the dam and then this is Beloit College up on the hill so it's kind of a town and gown um, and this is a historic picture of it um, with the rail coming in in the 1970s, they added the scrubber on because of the um, regulations about air quality. Uh, but it was always a kind of, it's a dirty power plant, but it was um, also really the foundation for a lot of the jobs in the area. And people were attached to it. A lot of people worked there. Um, so when we went to um, explore it for new uses, we looked at the way that it had grown over time, which was really in this serial ma manner. Um, and we... Um, continued that pattern and added the new field house at the north um, and then looked for what were good matches for the uses on the inside. So for the rec center, um, there's a track that kind of ties together all these different volumes. Um, there's a pool, there's a classroom, a lecture room, field house, et cetera, and different ways that we could reduce the operational energy of the place. But this is the way it looked when we first got there. It was, it's very, you know, um, ruin porn, I guess. <laughs> um, and then you have, like, really, but grand spaces. So in a way, it's a, a building you would never be able to have these generous spaces if you started from scratch. Um, and so um, one of the things that is a grafting aspect of it is how it, it ties this building, which was before kind of blocking people's access to the water, to become a generator of, of access. So it, it holds a whole new um, boardwalk along the river. And then inside of it, it has a, um, an elevator that takes you from the high hill of the, of the college down. So it's kind of like this machine for accessibility as well. Um, and, and I think it, it's been super well received. It opened up right um, kind of during the pandemic and made it possible for uh, the students to be able to be together in a very big space. Uh, this bridge was added. We added that to, to connect over from the hill and the college and then 
you come down the elevator there. This is the floating track and some of the um, spaces. All of this steel was in there um, These in these hoppers. Inside the hoppers are uh, is like a climbing gym. And just we tried to work with what was already there. And then this piece, which is that room that had the roof holes in it, is now their competitive gym. OK, so this is number two, the Kresge College, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, I'm going to go kind of fast through this because I haven't really talked about it ever before, but we've been talking about it within the office. Um, we just opened. Um, does anyone remember Kresge College? It was, it's designed by Charles Moore, the 1970s um, postmodern architect. Um, and um, it's in these incredible foothills right near Santa Cruz, uh, close to Monterey Bay, in a forest of redwoods. And it's an incredible site. For, and a lot of the people that go to school that are in UC Santa Cruz, if they're in Kresge College, they're usually in studying environment. So we started with just like looking who already lives here at, at uh, Kresge College. This is the, the um, their, you know, instead of having like a wolf or something as their mascot, their mascot is the banana slug. <laughs> and those are like mushrooms that grow on the, uh, the redwoods. And the, the students there, the whole thing was founded on this kind of um, um, participatory democracy uh, at the time. And um, it's, it's, it's very hippie. It's very interesting. And, it, and when at the time when it was designed, um, they decided to let the students dis build out their own dorm room. So they, they were given money, and they were just told to like design whatever. Um, of course, none of these things were to code, and there were all kinds of problems. <laughs> and some students didn't never design anything. They just stayed sleeping in the sleeping bags on the floor. So there were problems. But um, it was really an interesting experiment. Um, and, and this Charles Moore, I, I did not know so much about him, except for he was postmodern. <laughs> but when I started to learn more um, about his work, and he worked with Lyndon Turnbull Whitaker, and then Dan Kiley with the landscape. It was really interesting the way that they were thinking about this space as a kind of, like almost like an Italian hill town um, in the forest. And then there were these little, what he called um, um, trivial monuments that were scattered throughout the, the streetscape. Uh, one was like a mayor's stand, another, I mean, all this kinds of little follies, I guess, in a way. Very interesting, but kind of run down at this point. Uh, the students were not, at, when we arrived, the students were not exactly loving this place because it had kind of grown over. And there wasn't a lot of sunlight. And a lot of these experiments you know, didn't exactly work. So the, co the college asked us to you know, renovate and add new housing and new academic spaces. It was the one college with no academic spaces. This is a picture of how it looked um, in progressive architecture when it, when it was um, published um, in 1987. Um, and then what I found in the archives, we, our team found these, um, this TV show that Charles Moore did to get interaction with students and others. So you can see, so this was on TV. He was drawing on TV <laughs> and um, you know taking advice from, um, from part people participating. So we tried to you know, get that spirit back. The students really wanted to participate. And we um, coaxed them to come to meetings with, um, with these posters. And, um, and, but they really did want to. And so we, we were really engaged with them from the beginning. These are some of the meetings outside in this beautiful weather. And the other thing was like to try to, how to engage with this existing building by Charles Moore. So we, we participated in a, in a, I think it was a 40 year anniversary. This was at Charles Moore's house that they had and we presented the scheme, which was scary because we were afraid they wouldn't like it. And they, they encouraged us to also be our, have our own voice and to just mix in with the, the Charles Moore campus. Um, the co and the college asked us to do many different iterations from keeping everything to like getting rid of everything, which we didn't really want to do, but we looked at 
Um, and so then there were like discoveries along the way. This is original design for the academic building, which we later kind of inspired by those mushrooms growing down the uh, sequoia, decided to go down into the ravine with this, this building to keep it low. So just, just some modeling and stuff that we did during this time for the academic building, a rather, rather large academic building. Here it is. So, so at the end of the street, um, the, the classrooms are up at the top, and then the, all the offices and labs uh, trickle down into the ravine. We had this giant model. And the, these three volumes here are new residential uh, buildings placed to not kill redwood families and to be uh, visible through the Charles Moore kind of vistas. All of this really, everything's like wood construction. It's really impressive what uh, we could get accomplished with wood construction there. As you can see um, the, with the resonant halls, like a, a platform and then wood construction above. Um, and these are the final, you know, just what it looks like now, right before the students moved in. Um, um, these curving, bent residence halls with a new path that connects a, a loop around that connects into the Charles Moore. Um, so um, really understanding, these are the little uh, acorn woodpecker vents. <laughs> it's a rookery there. Um, you can get a feel for it. And so um, all of these lounges are on the ends of the, um, of the dorm areas so they can be more social. And here's a picture of the academic building um, that's stepping down into the ravine in the classrooms. And here's a picture of it, how you see it when you come across the ravine on this new bridge and uh, new connections inside the building. OK. Um, I've been talking for 38 minutes, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. I just wanted to show you this, though. For the frit, for the protecting the birds, uh, we used the 12 different species that are on site. So they're like these little critters. I don't know if you can see them. The banana slug is one of them. And the students really love this. And it's like their favorite detail. And they started to put the critters on, the, on all of their stuff. So it's kind of fun to see them um, adopting it. So the, these last two are really kind of similar projects that I want to show you. They're both museums that have a kind of grafted uh, extra capacity in them. Um, the first one I'll go really quick, which is the Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts. Seven different buildings built over time, or maybe it was eight. Yes, eight. And eight different structural systems and eight different mechanical systems um, with very strange architecture, as you can see in this picture. <laughs> um, but this place is this beloved place. And I remember going to the interview and um, with some very, very famous architects we were also interviewing. And, and I just, I was so taken with this place because it, it's a school, it's like, it's, a, it's an art school, it's galleries, it's a theater school. Um, it, it's everything a museum wants to be today, but they already had it. They just had a bad building <laughs> or eight bad buildings. <laughs> Um, um, so it, it was really exciting, and you can see in this picture there's a, this little 1937 building. That was the original building. So part of doing grafting, let's say, or adaptive reuse, and is you have to kind of you have to get to know the building very, very well to see what you can add capacity to. So. We found out that with these different systems, only one part of the building could take an additional floor. And then we had to make sense out of the, um, just the organization, which was very un unusual. And, and what we ended up doing is reorganizing the uses. And then this is the kind of spine that is a bit organic in shape because it had to connect different things. But it also clears the way for the 1937 building to be the front entry. This is up one level. So you kind of, it's the port cochere, there's a courtyard, and then this original building. And then this is how it bursts out into the park. And, you know, for the first time, it really kind of makes it connected. Um, we used white as a material <laughs> just to 
make everything calm down and connect. Um, and you would not believe uh, there's so many materials in this building, but just figuring out how to get white to work with the different parts was really interesting. <laughs> um, so this is the 1937 front on the, on the left um, and the model that shows how the room wraps around it above. And then this is, this is what that room looks like. It's really a cultural living room that's elevated. Um, and on the back, which is on the left picture, the restaurant that pokes out. So they, they just didn't have these kind of social spaces and they also needed more galleries. Um, this is looking back out to the Port Cachera with the, uh, the cultural living room up here um, and the sculpture of Henry Moore that they already had. And then this is looking down the spine area. So it's, it's connecting two different levels. It's bringing in light and, and, and making it more fluid for moving around. So, and everything else is kind of, it, it was about creating a new identity to this existing building. Okay, and then finally, um, just to talk about the Gilder Center here in New York at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, it's, it's always hard to talk about this building. I'm gonna take a glass of water first. <laughs> 10 years uh, more of my life, but. Um, <laughs> But it's also got so many really important themes that it's hard to m say what hierarchically what is most important. I mean, I think in general, the, the big philosophical change is we're not separate from nature, we're part of it, and, but museums set up this situation that made us feel separated from it, observing it in certain ways. And so that was one kind of thing we knew we need to undo because of the urgency of, of having to be part of nature and love it and be in it. Um, there's the site planning, which originally the building was supposed to be this kind of four square um, clear axis. Um, and, and looking at the old documents really made us realize that, you know, maybe we could get some make an addition, get some sense about like how you move through the building. It, you can see here that it didn't ever follow its own plan. <laughs> um, this is our, our site here. This is the first hall that they built, um, which was hall number one. Um, and then they had this courtyard and then they just started filling in all the courtyards. <laughs> and, um, um, and you can see it really clearly here. The yellow dot is where the addition wing is going to go. What's interesting with this one is, so this is on, this is 79th down the middle, um, and, and then you have um, the Central Park West over here. This building here, which is really anonymous looking building, has all of their collections in it already. It was like just a stack of collections. Um, this little building was a former power plant, which they replaced with this, and so they had stuck ichthyology into this like house which they needed to come out. So we tucked it back into this space here. The other really interesting thing is the site is on 79th Street axis. I don't know of maybe we can find some other buildings that are on an axis in the Manhattan grid but it's pretty rare I would say. Um, so that was special and we need we needed to understand that. Then there's the activity that goes on inside the building, real science, um, expeditions, um, a lot of people using tools like MRI to study their collections. So the collections are really alive and they are constantly being um, looked at and new things discovered about them. Um, and then it's just like, what are we building? What is it like in the taxonomy? What would you call what we're doing the, with this wing. So we started to look at all these different additions that they had and you can see we named them, we looked at what they were doing. Um, we decided that this new wing had to be both an axial hall, like some of the older buildings, but also an iconic entry. So the new entry that will be um, on Columbus Ave. So 
So that's what our goal was. It's both an axial hall and an iconic entry. Um, and then we had to connect, we wanted to connect um, to make this flow for the visitors much more intuitive. And even if you run into uh, very different collections, it gives the visitors a chance to make mental collect connections. And so that red outline is where the original building was supposed to be. This is how it ended up. And then this is a kind of our, our addition here. Um, and then this idea of editing to kind of clarify the, the connections. Um, and this is, of course, this, this big collections core that was there. Um, so there was a, also the, the aspect of keeping this park. So even though the original building was supposed to go out and take all of this park, of course, people love the park over time. And, and um, um, we, we worked closely with landscape architects and um, the community to understand how they were using the, the park and to try to preserve it. So that's why our building kind of steps back and connects. It pulls back in, in a kind of deferential way, I would say, um, to align with the existing weird combination of buildings that they have. I think there's 25 buildings. We made over 30 connections to those buildings. But mind you, when we're doing construction and designing it, um, this is all closed off from those other parts. So even though the design is meant to make all these connections, there's still lots of opportunity for future, more content-wise connections between these things that um, we didn't focus on for this, um, this project. We were focused on our uh, the, the idea of connecting education and science and innovation in one wing. Um, so this, this kind of shows the footprint of it. It had to house this big theater. This is the collections core, everything behind here and out here. Um, a library, classrooms, there's 18 classrooms inside of it. So it's really making a stand on science education, provi providing that through the museum for everyone. And this is just kind of a back in time, a first sketch, which was a collage of just like, how can we get people excited about exploration and, and discovery? And so, of course, the landscape is geological discovery and exploration is always something that um, gets me excited, I guess. <laughs> and and uh, we, we had a fun trip out west to just look at dif different uh, landscapes and their scales. And then just realize that, you know, these are um, contingent, all of these forms are contingent on their um, supports. And then there's erosion and, and things that happen that make them structures. And they're also like human in scale. That was interesting. Um, you can see these benches, and they just look like they were always there for people. Um, so to study this. Digitally and analog, we, we used every kind of possible tool, but ice being in Chicago in the win middle of the winter, it's a good tool. Um, melting it with um, um, water and like a little miniature blowtorch to get this feeling of this, because the software really wasn't working at all. It was just blobby, you know, blobby blobs. <laughs> um, so we ended up, um, what this is, and I still need a name, so if anyone has a good candidate name for this thing, please tell me afterwards. So it's the design is like this structure that is sitting on columns that it had to be sitting on because every, everything, the loading for the entire building comes below this, this space. So if you've ever gone to an event in, under the Blue Whale, everything for that event came through underneath this space. So we could only sit it down on a few places. So it's a structure made of shot creek, it's concrete, and it holds the floors of the new wing. So it's this, it's a structure, but it's not a cave, it's a, I don't know what. It's a, it's a, that's the architecture. <laughs> and there, the thing is there's no formwork. Um, we could never do this with formwork because it would be, everything was different it's so contingent, it's so dependent on its 
site. Um, um, you can see, and this is a model we made, but you can see where the like feet are coming down and how it has to span and create openings. This is a view, a little peek into the collections core. Getting into the mock-ups. Um, so Shotcrete is it's a way of creating a structure and it, which is used in infrastructure. Like down below Manhattan, there are tunnels, which we went and visited, and there were incredible like cathedrals under there. And people are down there building them with um, shooting the concrete into the rebar and then scraping it in. So it's, it's a technique. It's, um, used primarily for infrastructure. So we tried to, and the people that do it, some of them are quite, they're artists, you know, as well, because sometimes they're asked to do things for zoos or like make, make it look like a rock. So they kind of already, they know aesthetics. And if you ever saw these tunnels below this Manhattan, they, they look like they're incredible vaulted arches under there. Um, this is just some of the tests. And the other really cool thing about construction was that you, you, we had to, everything, you couldn't see it for so long because it was filled with um, scaffolding. And then they start at the top and go down, spraying the concrete. So that was weird. Usually buildings I've worked on in the past start at the bottom and go up. <laughs> so it was fun to see that and then to have, see the scaffolding start coming out. Um, and so you get this axial hall uh, with some interesting side spaces and portals. Of course, these portals are designed to carry the loads around the, them. They're not, um, um, you wouldn't be able to have a square hole in this structure. It wouldn't, it, it wouldn't distribute the loads. So all of that is structural. There's no finish. It, the concrete is the finish. It's kind of pure architecture in a certain way. And then this is one of the columns we could not move. It had to go down. But this is where we wanted the library. So it, it's a column with beams that come out. Um, and and um, it's the, the rare book library and the library. This is a little bit before it was finished. But uh, it, it's something that you see from the street. Then inside, you have this theater that's in the round, a uh, digital theater that allows the visitors to see things that you can't see with human eye from you know, microscopic to very, very big, all based, designed with the actual data sets from the museum. And then um, the insect collection that Jacques mentioned, my favorite with um, these leaf cutter ants who are, if only humans could be as cooperative and work together, <laughs> we would be in a much better place. Um, but they, they do, they work together and they harvest um, plants, different leaves or petals. And then um, this is Ralph Applebaum's design that they, they bring it back into these these orbs and, and they ferment um, the leaves. I think they throw up and then they ferment. I don't know, something like, it's very impressive. But, um, but they're just, this is just the way that they have learned how to survive and, and this whole uh, exhibit takes into account the way that they move and what they want to do. So that is um, the front of the museum. Really, it's just the, the inside moving to the outside and then being clad with uh, stone, which is a, the granite that is the original granite quarry that was used for the museum on the other side. So this is on the 79th Street axis. It looks light compared to its neighbor to the right, um, but it is, we felt that it, because it was an iconic entrance and it, it was directly across from the Central Park West entrance, that they should share materiality. Um, and then this alignment, I think, is the key thing here was um, realizing that because of the site and being on access with 79th Street, you have this great opportunity to align with not only the building inside and connect to that, but to the city of Manhattan and then, you know, the planetary connection beyond in the famous Manhattan Henge <laughs> events, um, so named by Neil deGrasse Ty Tyson, who is um, from the museum. So with that, I'll wrap it up. And, and these are the four offices, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and Paris. We, we work together very collaboratively, and um, some of our team is here tonight, so we 
thank you very much together. <laughs>
but it's always great to take advantage of that because you can experiment and yeah. it's not um, a building that's going to leak or something like that. So the experiment here was how to make it, s to see how much capacity there would be in marble and stone. Yeah. Which is not exactly like, you know, y everyone tells you stone is not going to work in tension. <laughs> but then after you start looking at it, there are some stones that actually do pretty well. Yeah. So yeah, it's suspend disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> You, you've been, uh, I mean, I love the beginning of your lecture also when you were claiming these post-industrial landscapes mm -hmm. as places that had huge potential and also acknowledging that even though they were impure, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm mixing words that you were using at different moments or hybrid or, but mm -hmm. they were basically mm -hmm. actually containing more biodiversity or yes. that, that the one that would be expected, right? Or y the yes. one that you could find in this green right. environment. Like that, yeah, like what, what does it offer? And it, mm. it turns out to be, you know, a crucible for nature to have biodiversity in cities yeah. that yeah. have these kind of spaces um, when all the, a lot of other spaces are, are being, um, becoming too efficient for them to survive. So yeah, there's like a positive thing in there. How, how th does that tension reflect in your in the development of your work? In a way, uh, we we really kind of imposed a hege hegemony on kind of green environments, clean mm -hmm. uh, toxicity being disappearing, kind of high end cultures. Mm -hmm. In a way, I think that your your work is giving value to situations that are much more impure. Mm. less perfect but but acknowledging that actually they're richer in many ways and that they have much more potential than this flattening of reality yes uh, that's that's so true um, i mean to there one downside is you know of course there are communities that are are um, burdened more heavily than others with these kind of mm. polluted environments and so that's the reason why um you know, another reason why I'm interested because it's 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 also like a chance to give voice to people that that are you know don't want this pollution in their space. But then you s you see in Calumet area, for example, um, descendants of the steel workers, which which really is everyone from yeah. from Lithuanian people to uh, Mexican people, African Americans, all. Everyone has worked in this industry in Chicago, and the the legacy of it is the a lot of people living in this area that's polluted. But there's also an adopting of of um, birding and 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 active yeah. uh, political action and ecology that's very thriving in that area, and so it's it's fun to work with people that are motivated to mm -hmm. change things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find let's talk about participation because yes. some of your projects have been presented as at one point processes that were participated and you were showing methodologies that you were using and even uh -huh. the kind of the the effort of curating a group of uh -huh. citizens to to work on them or models that could be shared or different options. What is the role of participation in your work, and mm -hmm. what is the moment in which you include that in those you included that in those processes? Because at the same time, I have the feeling that also there is a take for decisions that are personal forms that yes. are some of kind of. Well, I I think I mean participation. It doesn't mean that community members are taking your hand and you know yeah. drawing. They, but it's it's a process that that is like. It gives something to the project, and it, it also it gives something back to the participants, and so it makes us into a team, a, a, like a co-creating team. So my view of it is like, you know, we have certain skills yeah. in our lives, but other people that participate bring something else, yeah. and so if you can get that all together, and as the role of the architect, the one that can, you know, listen and kind of tease out the things that might be applicable to design, building design. Um, yeah. That's yeah. what we have to do. And then the benefit is, I mean, it takes time and patience. Yeah. Um, but the benefit is the support for the project. Like in Memphis, for example, yeah. 
when we had to go into the arbitration and all stuff, <laughs> there there were so many people supporting this project happening that it just the the people that were trying to keep it for themselves they had to backtrack out because they were no longer the most powerful group. It was the groups that were participating yep. in the design that wanted it. And so it's, it's also people are empowered to, you know, change the city to what they want to see. And mm -hmm. that, that is super exciting. So I like that power of like making it happen and we can't just do it ourselves because you could have a beautiful design and you know yep. if nobody wants it it's never going to get built so yeah how that is different from the the what you learned or what you were doing in the school of architecture like at, oh at yeah UST. because in a way i have the feeling that the works that you the, the projects that you're doing and making happen are incredibly participated social, or I don't know how to say mm -hmm. it, like they have a scale, they are included in locations that are incredibly sensitive for mm -hmm. many people. Mm -hmm. And I have the feeling that what you showed us today are, are projects that are not only explained in the, let's say design, mm -hmm. architectural design, mm -hmm. or the way that, the, that you would debate the design among colleagues, mm -hmm. but they are made possible through alliances that go beyond mm -hmm. the circle of architects. Yes, I would say that's absolutely true. And, you know, it's it's also, there's a spectrum of that kind of participation from the least being, you know, just informing people this is what's happening in your neighborhood to things in between and the most being like empowering people mm -hmm. to say what they feel and have it incorporated and be part of it. So, um, a little bit is dependent not just on us but on the client or whoever yeah. is the owner of the building or the space um, and so it's good to find clients or you know cities that, that want to do that so yeah we've worked with certain clients that don't want any participation you know they just want to like let's just get this built but we've tried to we've attempted to take some of the things we learned from Memphis youth design leadership and ask certain developers what do you think about you know asking doing a youth de design um, group and one of them actually mm -hmm. agreed and, and funded us to and worked with us to engage a group so maybe there's you know hope <laughs> <laughs> for for those private projects to to mm -hmm. be more open how do you share uh, i mean in a way you're an architect that are incredibly international and global in many ways. You work around the world, and uh, and and also an architect that you know you're you you lived in the Netherlands in Zurich, mm -hmm. in the, so I, I think you're connected to the global networks in many many different mm -hmm. ways. But at the same time, you're a well-known architect around the world, uh, very much connected to Chicago, and very much of a U.S. architect mm -hmm. in a way as well. Where, whereas in the past, I would say most uh, American architects would be related to references in Europe, in Italy, and uh, in mm -hmm. a way, your references are very rooted in Chicago. And your reflection, your book on the river, it's been mm -hmm. crucial to understand how you wanted to practice. And yeah. what, uh, it's it's very different in a way the yeah. way you speak of where you're grounded. Mm -hmm. And mm. I have the feeling that it's also kind of it indicating a change, right, for American architects in a way. Mm. Do you feel like that? Uh, well, I know that, like, just for for me, I mean, I I needed a, like, I, a muse. I needed a place, the city of Chicago, which is was so interesting to me growing up and, and all of its um, aspects, <laughs> um, like, to start to work in that place and just... That's where I start to develop a methodology of working. And now I feel like, we, so what we're doing is with these different locations is we're doing that same thing in different locations. Mm -hmm. So instead of thinking of like Studio Gang is a global firm that works everywhere, we're like these four local firms, I guess, that mm -hmm. then we connect to bring resources to projects that are further afield. But it's the the, I just feel like we need to know the place that we're in to be able to be effective. 
that's a, it's just a it's just in my name I guess it's just the way I feel mm. um, um, is it a different way I, I don't know I think there's always been there's been architects that are regional and local um, but what I think maybe the difference is that we're trying to draw those lessons and then apply them in in local ways elsewhere yeah. so so it was very useful to start in a place, I would say, um, mm -hmm. and to anchor into that place. My first projects were all community centers. So like one for the SOS you mentioned, um, the Ford Calumet, the Chinese American Community Center. Um, and um, yeah, these, these places let me meet people from the city in different neighborhoods and understand what they, what they want and why are they different and yeah. and yeah just uh, it really gave me a good look at Chicago from and the weird thing was then one day having a developer say do you want to design a tower <laughs> because I had been doing much more um, local work um, and so you know when that offer came I was thinking oh well that's interesting how would we do that in a different way or what's missing in towers mm -hmm. And what what we came up with in the office was just like you can't go outside, <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. then so it kind of because of, we knew that the material was going to be concrete, you know, for this particular building, um, we started just working with that. Like, what can we do with this concrete? Yep. And that's how Aqua came about. Yep. So it was a big jump in scale, but mm -hmm. similarly looking for ways to connect people through the the building. Mm -hmm. Let's open it to the <laughs> audience. I'm sure there's many questions <laughs> and there's microphones there, right? And there. So just raise your hand. Yeah, there's one here, maybe. And, and one here, maybe Clarice. Um, I guess I'll stand. <laughs> um, thank you for your lecture. At the very beginning, you mentioned the Burnham Plan for Chicago and its kind of resonant impacts on the city and your work. And in the context of your kind of focus on grafting, um, it seems like we can sort of understand even even architectural projects which aren't reusing structure or sort of grafting onto the urban ideas of kind mm -hmm. of urban plans for a city and things like that. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to, like, you know, as an architect who's sort of foregrounding a 21st century, kind of trying to push for a, a climate urgency and, and even just sort of 21st century ideas about mm -hmm. what a city should look like, how do you sort of find opportunity in these sort of existing plans from the past? H what are things that you find difficult about working with them or within mm. them? And then now you're at a point where you're designing really large urban spaces, right? These like river waterfronts and stuff. And I'm wondering if there's any conversation happening in your firm about how to set up those spaces to be grafted upon, mm. right? As like urban spaces that are gonna eventually mm. be built on. Is that something you're anticipating, trying to guide? Is there an attitude mm -hmm. towards that? Okay, let me see if I can sort through the question. <laughs> but um, no, I think it's a great, great question because um, you hit on something like one, one, of the re one of the difficulties, challenges about this idea of grafting is that everybody wants to, it's, there's a tendency to want to tear things down and start new yeah. because they get very messed up and also because there's incentives to do that, like, um, for example, there's a great book by Daniel Abramson called Obsolescence. If that's a really good read, but he's talking about <coughs> how obsolescence is a constructed idea about um, not about a building being worn out, because buildings don't really get worn out. I mean, you can always repair them, but um, obsolescence being an idea about something newer is available and in the states there is in the US um, there's an, a way to take tax um, right off for your building obs who, which is obsoles obsolescing uh, just because it's not as new or competitive with the next building being yeah. built so it's it's very interesting so there's like you know, a monetary incentive to, to tear things down. That's what we have to kind of, that's a policy thing that would be, we should be trying to work um, against. And then you mentioned um, 
with, oh, I think there's a really nice kernel that you said, how do you design something for the next round of whatever is going to come in there? And, and I don't actually know yet, but I think that's a very good question. It's a very relevant question because this won't be the last time, you know, you could graft onto it again. So how do you make it somewhat accepting of that or easier for that to happen? <clears throat> and I think part of it is that in doing this book on grafting, it's like you shouldn't be able to, you should be able to, um, um, let's see, if you have a building and there's an addition on it, um, they should be integrated, and um, but should not close down the opportunity for the next thing. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of um, Liebskin's building in um, Toronto where he did this very radical um, addition to the museum there. And I was looking at that thinking, because it's a very interesting, almost like a graft on there, but you probably couldn't add onto it again. That's so maybe there's some kind of that's that's the territory I think we should be talking about. I, I really do think yeah. that's interesting. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, as an educator, do you have any recommendations on how architecture students can be better prepared? to work with participatory uh, methods or participatory design, particularly when it gets rather contentious or controversial. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm wondering how you might apply the workshops that you did at Tom Lee Park or UCSC to the North Campus development at the University of Chicago. Mm. Yes, I, like again, that's, how could you apply it? It, it? Sometimes your client wants you to uh, uh, and allows you to do these kinds of interactions, and sometimes the client wants to more control that part. So, but to I think the first part of your question, how does how can you as a student learn to um, do these engagements? And I think um, what we did, we we got someone to help do teach us how to do it, honestly, because we didn't really um, um, have any experience with doing these engagement things. So we had uh, someone from the University of Chicago, actually, who was a, um, a facilitator come and do a workshop with us at the studio, mm -hmm. how to ask questions, how to listen, how to engage with people that you don't know about these topics. Okay, so that was then. But now what I've seen as a trend is now there are special uh, firms that are rising up or be starting to pop up that they, that's what all that they do. So, they're, so I'm just worried that we won't get to have that interaction as much anymore because we have a lot of team members that would be you know, specializing in that. But the, on the yeah. positive side, there's a lot more people doing the engagement. So there's more, more voices are being heard. Um, so, I mean, maybe in school we could have uh, some of these firms that specialize in that do a course or do, um, mm -hmm. you know, do seminar on that. I think it would be great. Mm -hmm. And so maybe here first and then there. Yeah. Um, so you all have a great experience in a lot of public projects that have uh, uh, many multiple answers to many social issues and questions. When moving, you've also done these incredible private, you know, condo or uh, you know, real estate development uh, structures. How did you find the translation from your experience in these, you know, public spaces to the private sector, and were you able to add your interest in these social questions to these projects that are more financially motivated? Mm. Uh, yeah, um, that's. Like, I think we, we try to think of the end users, I guess, in, in the projects that are, because there is a need for housing, there's a need for buildings, for um, people to live in. Um, and like, so I, it's a good question. Like I was saying with the um, Highline project, we hadn't really worked with on a project where we didn't know who was gonna be in there. So 
So in that sense, we kind of took the tactic of being like good for the public that would be using the High Line, good for you know being a good neighbor, I guess, as a building, and tried to turn that into a design. And so it was like the the angles on the building are are such that more light gets into the public spaces. So you just find your way, I guess. Uh, like you have to define what it is you're going to try to. Um, push on and in each project it might be if it's like a commercial residential ho housing maybe it's the unit itself like how can you make it a little nicer um, like for example in in um, Brooklyn where we did 11 Hoyt we were trying to eke out more space for people in these window seats which was part of the um, the, the facade is like these um, precast elements that created just a little more space and, and a built-in kind of for an apartment that's in a tall building. That's a, a huge benefit, like you know, in in New York City. So um, you got to find out where the the place is that you can operate. Mm -hmm. Is this on? Yes. Um, one, I want to say thank you for this, and thank you for the Gilder. I was there on Sunday with my grandparents. Um, it's a wonderful place. My grandmother, who has Alzheimer's, was floored by it. So, um, I want to ask you a separate question. Um, the dean started to talk about Americanness and the idea of having a kind of national identity as an architect. Um, nowhere is that more explicit than really with the overseas building. Uh, operations uh, and Studio mm -hmm. Gang's currently uh, building or has built the American Embassy in Brasilia. Um, so I was wondering how you feel about um, the kind of projection of uh, soft American presence through like the um, uh, relationship between the roster of like a nation's architecture firms and mm -hmm. their presence abroad. Uh, so the, the question is two parts. Um, do you feel like that project is both a symbol of American uh, presence in Brazil, mm -hmm. but also um, how does that project come about? How do you, how do you get approached by the State Department to mm. become that symbol of America abroad? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, I wish I could show that project. It's, I'm, it, which will be, it's in construction now, so soon. Um, we're designing the, the American embassy in Brasilia. So, so you have first, you have Brasilia, you know, how, uh, like to the first part of your question, how to, how to operate in that context. One of the really interesting things that about Brasilia is, I mean, everyone thinks of it as this place that was um, designed from scratch and um, with all this modern architecture. Um, but it, it's also, it's like not the tropical place that it has tried to become. It, it's, it's really a different landscape altogether. Um, and so part of our project there was um, working with local landscape architects to, to try to bring the, this prairie landscape that they have, the Cerrado, um, into the, the like into the mainstream that it would be adopted. So so that's a really interesting part of that project, I think. So it's you know getting into the ecology again, because that's not American. It is the place there. There it is that place. But there's also this need for for Brasilia to kind of to re capture their native landscape there um, and not try to impose the um, tropical part of their country on it. So that, I think, was a nice diplomatic um, space to be in with, with that project. Um, but then, like, there is symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism in the, the um, project, which... Um, we're on the fourth president that we since we started the project, but um, but when we won the project, um, it was Obama and it was eco diplomacy. So that was like the goal is like w when we get into climate change, how are we going to work together to try to help each other's 
with problems, and, and that's you know become more and more apparent. Um, and certain other um, administrations took away that aspect of it, like you couldn't say that anymore. So anyway, it's there. It it, it is a a political um, milieu, but there's still a need to um, have a presence and 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 to be welcoming. And so the symbolic part is like you know to to be open. And even though you have all the security, it's like how can it still feel like everyone's welcome in there? And my favorite story about that project is just that. You know, in, in Brasilia, there's the, these sectors. So there's the residential sector, and there's the business sector, mm -hmm. and then there's the embassy sector. And our neighbor on one side is France, and across the street is Russia. <laughs> and um, and we're, so we're in this embassy uh, sector. Um, we went, and there's some really cool embassy buildings there, too. Like Mexico has an amazing embassy. And so we went and visited all these embassies. But in all the embassies, there's no one in them, like two or three people from that country kind of rattling around. And in and, and the American embassy, there were like over 300 people, from mostly Brazilians, working in there. And I, I was struck by that. I was like, this is amazing. It's, a, it's people's job. And uh, they were bringing kids in and the weekends to um, use you know, some of the recreational stuff. And so it was really just a, a very vibrant place. And I, I was so impressed by th that as an idea about diplomacy, like hire people <laughs> to, mm -hmm. you know, have jobs. Mm -hmm. And it was really, um, it's an amazing place. Uh, so one of the cool things too was we had a garden in our, um, on our site from, a, um, um, Berlin Marx garden that was already there and um, because we only have one site and we have to build a new embassy and keep the other one open while we have the new one we the idea they thought that we would be tearing down this garden but we were able to keep it so it's a kind of a um, preserve it and and build new spaces around it so that's going to be really nice too to have a real Burley yeah. Marks piece in there. I, that's about all I can. I mean, yes, you have to be symbolic. Yes, it's um, um. Oh, how you asked? How did we get the project? Well, you you basically you put your portfolio together and you <laughs> <laughs> um, you make a this application and you put a team together and. And then you compete, and um, we were competing with Tom Main, I think was one of the other architects. And I can't remember who else, uh, but I remember Tom Main because he was coming out when I was going in. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, but it it was um, it's a lot of work to 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 go after it. But then, you know the the. And it's a long project too, long, long project. But it's really, I think, a project that's needed, and it's full of all these things that you have to consider. And just yeah, and so our project is really connecting more with the. It connects with the Brazilian architecture that's already there, the modern, um, and then tries to project an open spirit. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, thank this you. has been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.